Okay, now we're going to look at a more complex circuit, kind of our first real circuit in circuits one, and start applying some additional circuit laws we're gonna to need to solve it. So we're gonna to start today with what's called a model of a defibrillator. So once again, I'm taking a real world device and I'm gonna model its behavior. A defibrillator we're all very familiar with, especially those, for example, with a background in biomedical engineering, but we've all seen these used on TV and on movies where they take a device to restart a patient's heart, put it on the patient's chest, say clear, press a switch, and the patient jerks. Heart restarts and the patient lives. What's going on? Well, obviously some electric voltage is being applied to the patient to restart the heart, but exactly what's going on? Well, here I've created a very simple model. Here's our defibrillator. Here's the switch, and we're gonna close that to shock the patient. And here's our patient with a couple of paddles attached to the chest. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna create a very simple circuit model to model this kind of behavior. So what we're gonna do is first, I'm gonna take this defibrillator and I'm going to replace it with a voltage source and a resistor. I'm gonna treat that defibrillator as if it were a big battery. So just as we did before, I have a voltage source, a resistance, I'll call this VS with a value of a thousand volts. It's a high voltage jolt we give the patient. And this R sub D, this is the internal resistance of the defibrillator. And in this case, I'm gonna say that's about 50 ohms. Let's give it a value of 50 ohms. So this right here, this portion, represents our defib, represents this. Now what about the rest of the circuit? Okay, well, we are gonna run a connection over to the patient's chest and clearly electricity must flow through the patient's heart in order to restart the heart. Well, human bodies have resistance. Clearly they do, otherwise you couldn't be electrocuted, but you can be. And it turns out that the human heart and human skin can, if, since they conduct electricity, can be modeled as a simple resistance. Let's do that over here. Let's take this wire and then let's go over and let's draw a resistance. And this represents the patient's body. And in this case, this will be R sub L. And this is our human body resistance. And in this case, I'm going to assume it is 5,000 ohms. Then finally, we're gonna come back through this wire back into the defib again. Now, in order to make this defibrillator work, in order to shock the patient, we have to close the switch so we have a path for current to flow. So in this case, I'm just gonna close that switch it becomes an ideal wire, and then I'm gonna take that wire and complete the connection. However, I know that this wire is not a superconductor. It's not an ideal conductor. In the real world, wire is made of copper, made of aluminum. It has some resistance. In fact, all of this wiring plus the paddles must have some resistance along with the switch I closed. I'm gonna kinda of lump that all together and I'm going to define that as one additional resistance. And I'll call this R1, which is our wiring and switch resistance. And in this case, it's with the switch closed. So this is now our simple circuit model of the human body flowing through the current, flowing through the patient's heart, and then connected to the defibrillator. So this now electrically represents this. Okay, now that we've got that, it's time to start writing some equations. Now clearly, this is a bit more complex than what we did before. I have now four elements in this equivalent circuit. 
this defibrillator and plus human body model. So let's go through and let's figure out how we can write equations for this. All right. Now what we're going to need is we're going to need to introduce a couple of new circuit laws. And the first one we're going to need in order to solve this circuit is called Kirchhoff's current law. Kirchhoff's current law, and this is the second of the three primary current, current uh, circuit laws we're going to learn. The first one was Ohm's law, so this is Kirchhoff's current law. We abbreviate this as KCL, and in fact, throughout this course, you'll hear it called KCL. Okay, so we need Kirchhoff's current law in order to be able to write equations to solve the circuit. Okay, now how do we apply Kirchhoff's current law and what does Kirchhoff's current law say? Well, first of all, we need some definitions. In order to apply Kirchhoff's current law, I need to use the concept of what's called a node. So first step is we're going to identify all the nodes in the circuit. What is a node? A node is a point where two elements connect together. I should say two or more circuit elements can connect together. Okay, so how many nodes do we have in this circuit? Well, how many places do we have where two elements meet? Well, Voltage source of VS and RD. Notice I've got a wire that connects those two elements together. That's a node. And I'm going to label this and call this A. What about here? I've got a connection from this resistor RD over to RL. This is a second node. I'm going to label that and call that B. Then I've got another connection from this resistor to here, from RL to R1. I'm going to label that and call that node C. And then finally I have a connection from this resistor to the bottom of that voltage source. I'm going to call that node D. So I've actually got four nodes and I've now identified and labeled those nodes. Now something I want to point out. I drew these little dots just as a way of affixing the labels. That little dot is not the node. This is the node. The node is the entire connection. So that's the node. This is the node. This is the node. So the node is the entire wire. But you'll see sometimes these little labeled numbers or letters just so you can give a name to the node to stick that label on. But it's not the dot itself. That's not the node. All right. So I've got my nodes. Four nodes, A to D. Okay. Second, I'm going to define all unknown currents at each branch. 
Okay, what is a branch? A branch is a circuit element that has a node on each end. So in this case, how many branches do I have in the circuit? Well, I've got this an element with a node at each end, here, node at each end, here, node at each end, here, node at each end. So I've got a branch for every element in this circuit. So in this case, I've identified these four branches. I need to define the unknown currents for each of those branches. Okay? I should say actually this is for each branch. Now, when I define these currents, the direction I pick is arbitrary. So these can be chosen arbitrarily, and this is something I always try to emphasize to students. When you're going through and you're picking current directions to do or the various analysis techniques we're going to learn, pick one, pick a direction, flip a coin. It doesn't matter because you always get the right answer. Students say, well, Dr. Holman, what if I pick the wrong direction? Well, then once you get your answer, you flip it around and change the sign on the value. It's the same thing. So in this case, I'm just going to go through for each of these four branches and pick some arbitrary direction and put a label on it. So in this case, I'm going to pick a current flowing through that 50 ohm resistor from right to left. I'm going to call that I sub D. For this resistor here, I'm going to pick a current flowing down I'm going to call that I sub L. For this resistor, I'm going to pick a current I1 flowing right to left. And for this voltage source, I'm going to pick a current flowing through it called I sub S flowing from bottom to top. So in this case, I've just gone through and just arbitrarily picked those directions. Now, having done that, what's the next step? Okay, next step is I'm going to apply Ohm's law. So for any resistor in the circuit, Ohm's law dictates that the voltage and the current have to follow the passive sign convention. So if this is true, I can now use this to define unknown voltage variables for each resistor. Now here we see that I've chosen these current directions. Once I've chosen them, then I have to follow the pass the sign convention for those resistors. In other words, since I've chosen I1, the polarity must follow the pass of sign convention. I'm going to call that V1. Over here, my voltage must be VL according to the pass of sign convention. Over here, the voltage must be equal to 
VD according to the pass assigned convention. What about the source? Well, first of all, the source doesn't have an undefined voltage. I know what the voltage is. It's 1,000 volts. That's already given. But you notice, and sometimes this bothers students, they'll say, Dr. Holman, you defined that current going against the pass assigned convention. You're right. Because a source doesn't follow Ohm's law. Ohm's law dictates the PSC, but sources are not resistors. There is no convention that forces you to make the voltage or the current be, be drawn in a certain way. Now, if I were asked to calculate the power of that source, I would need the PSC. But in a circuit like this, I don't know whether the power is positive or negative. I don't know whether positive current flows out of the source or into the source before I solve the circuit. And so it doesn't matter which way I choose the direction of the current versus the voltage when I'm solving the problem, because in advance you don't know if the power is positive or negative. But once you've solved it, if you want to know the power itself and to calculate it, then you apply the PSC. And we'll see that later on when we go through and finish working this. All right, so what do we have here now? Let's look at what we have. We have unknowns. And those unknowns are IS, ID, I1, IL, VD, V1, and VL. Those are our unknowns. We can also write equations using Ohm's law. Because Ohm's law tells us that V is equal to I times R for a resistor. So in this case, I can write an equation for each one of those three resistors. VD is equal to ID times RD is equal to 50 ID. And V1 is equal to I1 times R1 is equal to 2 I1. And I just realized I never gave a value for R1. R1 is 2 ohms. There we go. Just to clarify that, I forgot to put that in before. So this is 5,000 ohms. That's 50. That's 2 ohms. There we go. And then VL is equal to IL times RL. And that will be equal to 5,000 times IL. So I've got three equations, but I've got seven unknowns. Well, obviously, as you guys know from linear algebra, you need as many equations as you have unknowns in order to solve a problem. We need more equations. Ohm's law by itself is not enough to solve. So what do we need? We're going to need KCL now, Kirchhoff's current law. How are we going to apply that? Okay, Kirchhoff's current law, KCL, there is basically a formal definition and a less formal definition that I prefer because it's kind of more common sense. KCL says this, the algebraic sum of all currents at any node equals zero. That's the formal definition of Kirchhoff's current law. But there's a less formal definition that I think is more, more that I think makes a little more sense. The currents that flow into a node must be equal to the currents that flow out of the node. 
Or to put it in an even more brief way, what goes in must come out. The sum of the currents going in must equal to the sum of the currents going out. And that's really kind of a good mathematical way to look at this. So let's consider what this means. Well, for example, let's draw something like this. If I had, for example, four connections to other components, and I'm not going to draw those, but I have them all coming together, connecting together, and these wires are all connected, and I've defined some currents, I1, I2, I3, and I4. What does KCL tell me? KCL tells me that I1 plus I2, which flow into the node, must be equal to I3 plus I4 that flow out. So there's KCL in a nutshell. But what if I give you something like this? What if you saw something that looked like this? IA plus IB plus IC all flowing in, nothing flowing out. Let's write the KCL. IA plus IB plus IC going in is equal to zero going out. Does that make sense? Actually it does. That's a perfectly valid KCL equation. What does that equation tell you? Well, if all of those currents are non-zero, one of them must be negative, at least one relative to the others. So this works, just some of those, at least one of those currents is going to have a negative value and the others will have positive values. So here are a couple of simple examples of KCL. So let's go now and let's apply KCL to this circuit. We have four nodes, so I'm going to write four KCL equations, one for each node. I've got nodes A, B, C, and D. Therefore, for node A, I have IS flowing in, ID flowing in, nothing flowing out. IS plus ID is equal to zero. For node B, ID flows out, IL flows out, nothing flows in. So zero flowing in is equal to ID plus IL flowing out. For node C, IL flows in, I1 flows out. So IL is equal to I1. And for node D, I1 flows in and IS flows out. And there we have our KCL equations. So you look at that and say, this is perfect, Dr. Holman. I've got one, two, three, four equations, five, six, seven equations. If I add my Ohm's law, I've got seven unknowns. I can solve the problem. Except as you find out, you can't. And the reason is, these four equations are not linearly independent. You have a linearly dependent equation in this set of equations that can be created by combining the other equations together. And in fact, if you look at this, you can see that ID plus IL is equal to zero. So I can replace IL with I1 and then I1 with IS. And then A and B become the same equation. And so by combining these three, I get that equation. So it turns out I have only three linearly independent equations. OK, three linearly independent equations. That means I still can't solve the problem. 
I've got three equations, only three linearly independent equations. I'm still lacking an equation. In fact, we see here an issue that crops up in any kind of circuit analysis. In a circuit with n nodes, and this is one of the principles of circuit analysis and network theory, which I will simply state without proof, but you can certainly find this discussed and proven in a lot of textbooks, but it can be shown that in any circuit with n nodes, only n minus one linearly independent KCL equations can be written. And in fact, we're going to hit this brick wall every time. Ohm's law plus KCL by themselves are insufficient to solve this problem. I need something else to solve in order to give me that seventh equation. And that's going to be what we're going to look at next time, KVL, Kirchhoff's voltage law.